Well, I'd like to welcome Ken Edwards to the podcast today. Ken was born in rural Utah in the 70s. He grew up loving the outdoors, family, and his religion, Mormonism. Religion and spirituality have been a part of his life for decades, and after coming out as a gay man and leaving the Mormon church, which we're going to have to talk about, he searched for years until he found the runes of Northern Europe. For over a decade, he has been sharing the wisdom of the runes through classes, rune, psychic readings, and the Blue Antler, his spiritual metaphysical shop located in T Tool or Tueli, Utah. How do you? Um, it, 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 it's pronounced Twila, uh, Twila. but um, yeah, we're actually, uh, that actually closed in December. We actually <gasps> cl finally closed it, yes. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. well I, oh, <laughs> I hope that's okay. I hope it's good. It's a, a chapter closed. Oh, something yeah. new open. No, no, everything's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a it was a very good experience and one that I uh, sometimes wish was still happening. But um, it's better. It's better that it's not. Perfect. Yeah. Well, why don't we kind of start at the beginning? Because of course, you come from fundamentalist. Well, I don't actually know if it's fundamentalist Mormonism, and if there's different types. Why don't you talk about your childhood as a Mormon, and yeah. your spiritual awakening? Sure. So um, I, I was born in Salt Lake City, because that was one of the nearest hospitals. But I grew up in a very small town of about 300 people. Um, called Stockton, and uh, my family, uh, I'm fourth generation there. Um, my family came from Wales, mostly, and were miners, uh, so it was a, a proper place, place for them to settle. Um, I my, my upbringing was very contained. <laughs> um, even if you weren't a member of the church, uh, the Mormon church, which is not not the fundamentalist. Um, I belong to the more normal mainstream sect, sect I guess, uh, of it. And um, yeah, it was it was very contained. Like even if you weren't a member of the church, all the community functions happened at the Mormon church. So it became uh, I I went to church every Sunday. Uh, I participated in every uh, activity there was. Um, I held positions within my age group and then also broader as I got older. And um, it was always something that was very important to me. Um, and then, uh, you know, it kind of uh, shifted away um, when I began to realize probably 2021 that the world was much bigger <laughs> than my little tiny white picket fence uh married with three point well in utah four point maybe five point six kids um uh you know the house all of that stuff the world was much bigger and there was much more to experience and i had always knew that i known that i had not quite fit in uh with everyone else <laughs> um not that we all should fit in with everyone else anyway. I think that's blah. But uh, I think that uh, that really spurred um, some questioning in me. And um, when I realized that I was attracted to men, um, which, by the way, 40 years later, well, almost 50 years later, I'm still unpacking all of that, right? Like, that's that's a, a journey in and of itself. Um human sexuality and and diversity but the uh yeah it became it became a moment where I was like this you know dear god it's me Margaret praying <laughs> <laughs> uh day in and day out uh let me know that this is the right path for me because if you don't give me a sign I um, I'm not I'm no longer gonna fight this i'm not i'm not uh i'm not going to yeah i'm not going to continue to fight and to, to, to beat the shit out of myself because i am not fitting in and i one day was um attending a session at the temple uh and i was it was afterward and i was sitting in the celestial room which is a very beautiful room and I prayed again and I said, you know, please, please take this from me. 
and if if you if you can this is who i was meant to be and this is part of me and i and i can't keep going against that and you're speaking uh, specifically here about your homosexuality take that from you yes okay yes which which uh pause the story <laughs> uh you know like as i as i've gotten older i realized a lot of things you know we, uh, about how i was raised and, and the ideas about it and I consider myself um, actually more, I, I guess the kids would use the term omnisexual these days. Um, I don't even know if the kids know what that means, but it's more of um, attracted to anybody. And uh, I, I, it's not that I don't see gender, I do see gender, but I'm attracted to the, the kind of the spectrum of that. So my last relationship I was actually in was uh, uh, with a cisgendered uh, heterosexual woman. So. And that was, you know, a, a very beautiful experience to have at this kind of stage in my life, um, where I'm really continue to break through and break out of that concept of binary, and just there, there only has to be one or the other, and that's that keeps us too locked in as a, a step that doesn't serve us. So, right. going back, um, yeah, it was I was really struggling with my sexuality and. Um, at that point, I did not receive an email or a text or whatever. God ghosted me. Um, not that that really happened, but you know, like th th it didn't fall into place. And um, when so you say when you say it didn't fall into place, are you saying like you didn't get a, like a direct answer to that prayer? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And there were times, and I should I should preface it too with this: like there were times in my life where because I was so close. And so connected to, to that deity, that God, the Christian God, um, the, I, I had received answers before. It wasn't like this was my only time ever asking and I didn't get anything. So I had for years, I mean, years, um, read my scriptures every day, prayed, served other people. And I'd done all these things and I had done it while receiving the, like, communication from God and that not in terms of like everything spelled out but you know it's a very still small voice that speaks to you and that's it's a peacefulness that comes over you and when that didn't happen um I I knew I'm like okay well I have felt what it feels like to have that happen and it's not happening so I'm just gonna take a step back from from it and I'm going to explore this part of me that is my resistance to is creating so much chaos. Um, and I wanted to kind of explore uh, what that looks like, um, not being so resistant to it. Uh, and so that's kind of where wow. my adult has started. <laughs> I just find that to be so brave i come from fundamentalist christianity myself like literalist okay. biblical christianity um wow. and to make a decision and a choice to authentically explore and embody this part of yourself that's emerging that does run counter to what dogma and doctrine would say is true is a scary place to be i mean i've you know it's a scary place to be but it's also such a courageous place to be and, and from time to time god calls us in that way right to be courageous and to step into who you truly are. And it's not just about sexuality, of course, but that's kind of the first step towards becoming who you are authentically. So I just want to say that that's, that's amazing. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I feel like, um, I feel like it was the opening for me to really just start breaking down the box I had created around myself that was all self-imposed and all ideas of what my life should be based upon other people's thoughts and ideas and based upon even my even my small community which I actually still live in um and everyone knows me every, we're all you know we all still know each other and we would do anything uh to help out anybody in the community um, and yeah, so that was kind of the, the point where I was like, okay, this is, <laughs> this is not working. Let's try something new. Um, and 
yeah, it was a series of, let's see, that was probably, it was probably 21, 22. That was a series of probably a good 12 years of just, I'm going to build my career. I'm going to party. I'm going to have a good time. I'm going to travel. I'm going to meet people and just kind of experience life. And then, but always dabbling in and kind of on the back burner or at least on my radar, like looking for spirituality that connected, that I connected to. And that, that was a hard one because I never really found it. Um, there were little bits and pieces here and there of different religions. The Eastern um, spiritualities are, are beautiful. I never resonated with it. Um, Celtic, uh, I resonate with to a degree, but it never completely fit. Um, and yeah, so it, it was it was a search. And, and, you know, you know as well as I do that we all go through this. <laughs> mm-hmm. We all go through this like, oh, this shirt's a little tight. I don't, maybe I need to get a different size shirt or maybe a different style, maybe a different cut would fit better on me. And so we kind of, oh, I like this one. I like the color, but the fit's not quite right. So we keep trying things on and um uh and yeah eventually I I had uh had just moved to Portland Oregon and this was oh gosh 2009 I guess and um which seems like yesterday but really when we do the math it's I know it's great it's crazy when you think about it <laughs> oh my gosh mm-hmm. um so uh I walked into a bookstore bookstore called New Renaissance Bookstore and um, there was a woman there who had this beautiful white, curly, messy hair, not messy, but like wild. And she was doing readings and I had no idea what runes were, um, none. And New Renaissance Bookstore is a bookstore about spirituality. <laughs> so it has books from A to Z on every spirituality you could think of it, uh, across the world. So. She was there and I had a reading from her and that's when I first felt I began to feel like I was at home with these these beings that are the runes and with this cosmology that comes from uh, pre-Christian Northern Europe. Um, And it started to like it vibrated with me a little bit because not just because of my ancestry being from there, but that's just where it started to feel more like oh, this not only makes sense in my brain, but it makes sense to my body. And um, that's, yeah, that's kind of where it started. I began working with her and then um, and she and I are still very, uh, very close, very good friends. And, um, you know, the rest is kind of like, well, the rest is on social media now. <laughs> now right. It's not history. It's still there. <laughs> right. So you're also known as the Rune Walker, and you're also a psychic. Are you a medium as well? Um. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> I came up with the term Rune Walker. Um. Because I really, I don't like labels. They're not my favorite. Because I think it's great because it helps us identify and helps us connect with people. Um, and I don't like the box that it brings to me. <laughs> I don't, I don't like the box it puts me in. So because I experience things, um, psychically through all of the clairs, um, and I experience mediumship, um, I don't like to, to box it all in. So I kind of throw it all under the umbrella of Rune Walker. And um, like I, I also do energy work and energy healing, and I work with herbs and uh, things like that. So I didn't want to box myself in. So I'm like, I'll give myself a label that I'm in control of. Uh, and it was great. So um, yeah, I, I actually, and I, I worked a couple with a few like missing persons cases. It's, it's an interesting to be connected to... I call it like being connected to the internet because then you're connected to everything. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are so many different things we can do um, as as humans with connection. I I think that that's where I I sit with it now is I try and accept a label and then let it go if I I need to, if I'm getting 
Right. That that's an interesting um, position to be in. So you're Gen X. I'm Gen X. You know, and and mm-hmm. it seems like, and so we came up through the '70s, '80s, '90s, and it seems like the world now is really, really. Um, uh, they love labels <laughs> or categorizing themselves and don't really realize yep. that there's inherent limitation that comes along with with labeling yourself in any way or telling a story that you fix yourself to and put yourself in a box as you've just described. Um, can we dissect a little bit, kind of go back and talk sure. about, so you go and you meet this woman at this cool bookstore, she's uh, pulling out runes and you feel maybe a past life or ancestral kind of a resonance inside of you, just a familiarity that feels like home. Mm-hmm. And so right. take us on the like pathway to the first time you realized, oh, I can do this too, or I'm psychic, or when the lights start coming on in the proverbial psychic house, like how did that start yeah. for you and how did you deal with it? And did that echo back into your, you know, Mormon childhood? And and how, did you have to reconcile some of that? Uh, I am still reconciling that. Okay, me too. Um, you know, right. I mean, it takes like, if you, you know, if we think about it and in, in just pure logical terms, it took, it took me 21 years to build, and they were all during the very formative years, uh, to build my life around, based around this Christian religion of Mormonism. And it's going to take longer. It's going to, it's not going to happen overnight where I can just be done. Like, oh, I didn't, I don't really believe that anymore. And like, let it go. Um, so, um, so. I call it the process of remembering, actually, and and um, and I and I got that from her, and I really like it because too often we we search outside of ourselves for all of the answers, which means we don't know and we can't know, and we don't believe that we we are able to know just for ourselves, and uh, so it's a process of remembering. So I felt like I began to remember little things like, and not in the literal way, but it began to settle and it felt comfortable. And that when I say remember, that's kind of what I uh, am talking about. So it's this feeling of, oh, that makes, oh, oh, I know that even deeper than with my brain. So I took, uh, I studied with her for quite a few years before um, I ended up moving back to Utah. And she, um, it, it was an interesting box to be in at first because it was one that felt comfortable. And as I learned about the runes more deeply and actually began to con- connect with them um, through ritual and meditation, um, and they began to express themselves to me in more ways than just a symbol on a page and a definition in someone else's book. That's when I began to, I actually, let me pause that. I always knew that there was something different and that I could experience things differently. Even in college, I would you know, hold my roommate's hand and tell them like, okay, this is what I see for you. Like it was, it was always this, a, a parlor trick back then. You know, it was, a, it was this little thing that you could do and it was fun. And we all talked about who you were going to marry and blah, blah, blah. Cause that's what you do when you're Mormon and 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's all we're worried about. Is um, so uh, I had had all these experiences. So I then began having more psychic experiences with the runes and um more impressions and visions and i began to experience them in a very visceral way so would this be happening as you're doing a reading or like how did this, so this begin to happen before i began doing readings okay so this is me just using my um type a personality wanting to know everything about it studying everybody's book everybody's idea about what it is because i have to memorize what it is because I can't know what it is for myself, right? That's the mentality. Um, so I'm I'm fighting I'm fighting this inner battle of I need to know in my brain, but my body already knows and has some memory of this experience and these things, um, because literally genetically passed down. So 
I, I am having this internal battle between knowing and knowing with my brain and knowing with my instinct and my intuition. Well, I never, I always kind of thought my, my path was to just teach about the runes and to share about the runes um, and to help facilitate people's introduction, not only to the runes, but to themselves. That's where I, that when I still do readings and things, when I work with people, that's my main focus is introducing them to the runes, but also introducing them to themselves, whether or not their runes are part of that. So for the longest time, I thought, well, I, I'm going to practice doing readings because I think that's something I would like to do. Well, it's like learning tarot. When you do readings for no one, you don't have the context to put the information or the message into their life. So it took me, that's probably one of my biggest, biggest tips for people who are new to reading cards or tarot or doing psychic readings or whatever is like, you can't practice on no one. You, you, need, you need the context of someone's life to be able to deliver the message that, that they're asking for or that the qu answer the question that they have. So it took me about a year of throwing the runes and trying to interpret them I'm rolling my eyes because I just now looking back on it, I'm like, how was that <laughs> just the most simple thing that you did not get? Um, and then I, I, I finally was like, wait, I'm missing, I'm missing something. And what I'm missing is the other person sitting across from me. Well, that's the biggest leap of faith that we, <laughs> we want to take. And that's the hardest one to take is actually putting somebody in front of you and then reading for them. So once I did that, which actually happened after we opened Blue Antler in Utah, which was, I don't know, 2017, something, 16, 17. So I finally started to believe in myself and what I could do and that I wasn't just hearing little sock puppets in my head. Um, and I began reading for people and that's when at first, it was the craziest feeling um, to acknowledge and accept the connection and to begin um, to develop a relationship of trust with, with the connection, which just is building a relationship of trust with myself. Um, I experienced it in the beginning. Uh, my business partner would tell me, you look a little crazy because um, I would experience anytime I was um, really connected and um, not necessarily receiving information, but like kind of, uh, I would feel a little like um, tickle on the back of my head and down my neck. So we can control whether or not we're receiving messages and um, we can put up like a business hours, like, hey, I'm receiving messages from the other side between nine and three today. <laughs> um, it doesn't have to be out of our control. So I didn't know that back then. <laughs> so I would, I would take and I would dust off the back of my head with my hand to get that energy to move off of me so that I wasn't, because if I couldn't understand it or interpret it, I would just try and move it off of me because I don't need to sit in it. And um, I was, so I would do that quite often. And he just would tell me how crazy I looked. He's like, are you having a moment? I'm like, yes, leave me alone. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm trying to get this energy off of me. It's fine. Um, so, uh, and then the psychic stuff, when I, when I really started speaking to the dead, uh, that was an interesting one because it came out of nowhere. Can you tell uh, us about the first time it happened? Yeah, sure. Um, I was working Blue Antler and I had a client or a customer come in and it was quiet. It was late in the evening and all of a sudden I felt something and I just kept talking to her and I'm like, so I ran with that. I just was learning to trust myself. I ran with that. And I said, so, you know, is your mother passed? And she said, yes. And um, all of a sudden I'm not a big, I love to stop and smell the flowers, but if you ask me what flower it was, I couldn't tell you. 
if you ask me what I know what roses smell like because I have them, but that's it. I said, your mother had a favorite flower. And she said, yes. Well, I smelled a flower and I said, gardenia. And she said, yes. And I said, I smell it. I couldn't, I couldn't today pick it out for you, but I just knew what it was. And, and she's like, yeah, her favorite flower was gardenia. And I said, I, I smelled it just now. And then that opened up everything. Um, it was after that, I was like hungry to uh, experience more. I was hungry to have more um, opportunities for confirmation um, of what I was feeling and that it was where we were. Um, another one that happened just shortly after that was uh, I was talking to a woman and we were talking about her father who had passed away, his tobacco, which I smelled. And she's like, yeah, it was the most horrible thing. We tried to get him to change forever, but he wouldn't. Um, and then I'm looking at her and this tiger jumps out from behind her back. So in when my, you're in your mind's eye or like, did you just yes, know that? In okay, my mind's eye. eye. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I was about to, I, I was about to try and explain that. So <laughs> I'm watching her. And so actually let's, if we can take a second. Do you remember those um, viewfinder picture things with yeah. the little disc? Okay. Um, looking at an image that I get in my mind, I know it's not created by me if it looks like one of those. Because you know how even if you're looking at, even if you're looking at a photo in one of those, there's something different about the photo. Like it looks different. Um, and so that's how I know it's a little different. So, or not from me. So I, I see in my mind's eye, this tiger jump out from behind her and I, it startled me. And I, I just stopped her for a second. I said, I'm gonna tell you what I just saw because I don't know what it means and I'm gonna need your help because it's yours. She said, okay. Uh, I told her and she started to tear up a little bit and she goes, um, I had a cat whose name was Tiger and it used to sit on my shoulder mm. and it would protect me and it would growl at people it didn't like, it would hiss at them. And I said, great, great. You know, like it's being protective of you. It's a protective, you know, animal for you. Great, makes total sense. Um, and going back to the beginning, you know, we, I can say things that I experience, but if, if I don't have you or the person I'm reading to make sense of the message or the image, my mind kicks in and then that's when everything gets jacked up. Because if I try to make sense of your message, then it gets a little messy. Um, but most of the time, like now, now it's graduated a little bit to um, the dead. The first thing they do when they connect with me is they, through my body, uh, tell me how they died, which can be really, this is where like the person I'm reading has to be has to be open to giving me confirmation um, because they don't always tell me names, but they absolutely, I feel it in my body where they died. Um, this is one of the most shocking ones that I've ever had. And it was, uh, it's disturbing, but it, it was a good lesson. I said, I feel, I feel like my head is hurting and I feel like it's exploding. And she said, that's exactly who I wanted to connect with. And I'm like, well, what, how did they die? And she told me that he had committed suicide with a gun. And I was like, and, and then I felt like, oh crap. I didn't even think about like, that hadn't crossed my mind as an option. I just feel pain and explosion in my head. I didn't think about it being that. And she's, she's like, no, no, no. It's, it makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, and that then we could move on. So it's a very interesting uh, concept to connect with the dead, which I don't always do in readings. 
um because it really just depends on um kind of what the person's there for and if the threads of their life that we're delving into or or looking at are connected to somebody who who has passed or or a spiritual being or a different being then then they can come through but if we're really looking at like you want a new job okay well you haven't been looking for one so maybe you should look for one if you would like a new one you know if they're very mundane simple things like that it's no big deal but sometimes um yeah it's necessary to have a little bit of i should say this sometimes the other side has an opinion not that they're always correct but sometimes the other side has an opinion so not that they're always correct that's interesting because i think people uh, would consider getting a message from the other side as like foolproof like oh I, I heard it from spirit so it must be true but uh, under what circumstances would you say that it wouldn't be true if you're getting a message um, i so uh i recently had, um i recently had somebody who uh i had her grandmother mm -hmm. yeah and i said so your 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 grandma like she would like you to find a young man who is not who's more stable and and the girl was like what do you and and then she goes no never mind I guess. <laughs> like she just wants the best for you and what she thinks is the best for you is somebody who is a little less emotional a little less chaotic um which is what this person is attracted to and liked about that person but I said you know you really grandma's just telling me this this is this is her opinion about this is what she would really like for you to find um and same young lady, uh, actually, it was um, uh, her tattoo. I said, your grandmother wishes that your tattoo were in a place that you could cover it up more. Okay. But it doesn't, <laughs> you know, right? Like, so they, they it's funny because they still have these little opinions and they have, um, sometimes they're funny and they just laugh and, and, and they are, I love the ones that are, um, kind of like just they're still so full of energy even on the other side that their personalities are you know either snarky or or sassy like I get a lot of sassy grandmas which is very funny to me because then they then I'm ha I'm listening to them trying to talk to somebody else <laughs> and I'm like I need you to like <laughs> Pipe it down, pipe it like, down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like <laughs> this, yes, I know you're excited to talk, but like, you know, and they, and they get, they're funny. And sometimes it's the, 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 the stories are sad. Sometimes um, it's the, the most mundane things that, um, that they show me. And that's how I connect with the person that, I, that I'm talking to. Well, it's the mundane things that provide important and dynamic validation that there is something beyond this yeah. world like and that's the ministry and gift of mediumship a lot of people i think think of it as something quite spooky but no it's a validation you're serving the dead but you're also serving the living and you're kind of building that bridge and i do think it's interesting how people think some people think once somebody dies they are suddenly maybe deified like they're all of a sudden an avatar no they're just the same personality so grandma's coming back and she wants you to cover your tattoo there's still people they're just dead typically yes <laughs> yes. Yeah. And there, you know, I've really found it. It's interesting. And I don't know what other people's experiences. I try not to, I really try not to read too much because I really love when I experience something and then I read about someone else having the same experience. I'm like, okay, great. That just helps me solidify the fact that I can know within myself and I can trust myself. Um, so yeah, I love having um, those um, type of experiences where um, where was I going? Oh, that's where I was going. So, um, nope, actually my train got derailed. That's Look okay. That. I've got a lot of questions okay. for you to keep, we'll keep oh. talking about something else. Well, has anything ever scared you? Have you ever been scared, startled, freaked out by something that's happened in the world of spirit? And how did you handle it? If so? Um, yes. But it's more, it's more that it's always quite startling. Like, mm -hmm. I wasn't quite prepared for that. Or I wasn't quite prepared to experience that energy. The what, oh, 
actually the building I'm in right now. Let me tell you the story. Okay. Uh, it was an old police station. And so downstairs is where they kept all the cars. And it, it's not like a scary place. It's not like a old Western mining town, ghost town. It's not. It's a cinder block building. But one night um, I was here and I went to take um, some bottles downstairs to put them away. And I went to go down the ramp and all the lights were off downstairs, which by the way is probably all of us from a kid had this fear of going downstairs and then having to turn the light off at the bottom and run up the stairs, right? We all had this, this something's coming, from at, coming at us from the dark. But I started to walk down the ramp and I heard three male voices and I'm like, and at that point, this is like within the last year or so. So I knew they weren't embodied. I knew they didn't belong to bodies here. And I, so going, and I heard it and it startled me. So I kept going down and I'm like, hey, uh, I'm here. Like, I just, you know, hey. and I got <laughs> down to the bottom, turned on the light, the voices stopped. No one was down there. Those are the ones that startle me the most because I'm just not quite prepared right. for them. Um, and and the ones and I think the ones also that startle me the most are the ones that really show that your these things are real. You know, like it's real. We're not messing around. It's real. That flew across the room. I've never had that, by the way, but it's real. Like. The, it's real those mm -hmm. are the ones that kind of shake me not, not to my core but they vibrate as like a okay I still don't have a good comprehension of the, the expansiveness of what life is and that one hit me right there and we're gonna yeah <laughs> um as far as like scary things well um, I think like with, with some people I think that you know, they're curious about their innate spiritual gifts, and I believe we all have yeah. them. But there's that fear that if I open up to that, then I got shadow people, I got demons, I got all these scary types of spirits. And then some of the work that I do, you know, I we always start at the, the ground level. We talk about divine self, divine concept of self, your own dominion. And we talk about kind of living in a fearless way, way in the spiritual ecosystem. So I only yep. ask this because I think some people are like legitimately afraid of what they might see. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. Uh, thank you. I'm glad that you brought that up because I feel like um, I feel like most of the time, um, and this this goes for our interactions from person to person too. I think I really feel like this is a big one. We feel when we feel some other energy, it freaks us out. <laughs> Most of the time, it's a feeling or an emotion, um, and we don't know how to interpret. And when we feel someone else's energy bump up against ours, we think we're being attacked. <laughs> oh my God, I'm being attacked. Actually, what you're feeling is love or <laughs> what you're feeling is compassion or what you're feeling is excitement. I think excitement's the big one. Like, oh my gosh, I can interact with this person. And you start to feel this intense vibration and they're like, oh my God, I'm being attacked. I know I'm being attacked. Well, no, you're, you're, 99% of the time you're probably not um it, it has I, I feel like we need to get much better at understanding what the vibration of emotions feels like and when I talk to people about their developing their own skills whether they feel like they're an empath or or whatnot the first thing we talk about is okay if your hand is here and my hand is in front of it not touching but I can feel your energy. So one of the best trainings to do is do that with someone you trust and ask them, okay, I want you to think about your dog, someone that you love. I want you to think about the first time you got scared um, and then feel the difference in the vibration between the hands. And this is not something you learn overnight. This is something that you finesse 
and and get better at um, over time. But at least you then start to begin to feel that the emotion that that person is producing produces a vibration. And so the vibration you will feel very differently depending on what emotion they're feeling. And so when you then begin to be able to translate the vibration you're feeling into an emotion or you know, down the road, even a thought, then that is where you start to be able to really communicate and to be able to understand from a point of I'm not being attacked and I don't have to fear this interaction. I can, there's someone just trying to call, like my phone's vibrating. Oh God, it's attacking me. No, someone's calling you, right. you know, like, and, and I, I use very simple and, and probably a little no. elementary no. ideas, but it's perfect. It's very much. Thank you. I, I, I feel like I feel like even that's even yes, when we can't see what's happening, what where the vibration is coming from, we get freaked out a little more. But we even do that with just interpersonal relationships. We don't I, I think we do it with ourselves. I think like the body and oh, spirit yeah. are always trying to bring up like things that it's trying to heal and clear, but we feel it and we interpret it as anxiety and we try to pivot yeah. and do something different and not actually sit in what the emotion is trying to communicate with us. Yes. Yes. That uh, yeah, I think. Um, and not that this is the case every time, but I think the anxiety comes from a, a resistance to sitting in that. Um, right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Well, and that kind of dovetail ni- dovetails nicely with, I, I kind of wanted to go back to you stepping into exploring who you truly are um, mm-hmm. and how I think working with uh authenticity and also your stuff and that can be shadow that can be your belief system how i feel that's uh, critical to spiritual development and dealing with the things that you're carrying around because everything you're carrying around in terms of a belief or an unforgiveness or a or if you have a problem with your own concept of self that that takes up space inside of you those are patterns Mm -hmm. of energy that you're actually lugging around and i believe they actually exist in parts of your body and if you give them enough energy they'll begin to crystallize and physicalize and now you've got a symptom of something so i think yeah. dealing with your stuff is is so it is the doorway to an evidential spiritual life and i want to share with you that um you know growing up as a fundamentalist christian i mean i learned what judgment was <laughs> you know we judged everybody yeah. you know, everybody was a sinner except for me or whatever um you know my daughter yeah. she's also she's gay um and I always had a heart for uh, people who were different and also people who were specifically homosexual or queer or gay, even in the 80s. You know, I, I graduated in 86 from high school and there was always like the gay kid or two who was always bullied and I saw it all and it was just tragic what we grew up seeing. And of yep. course, 90s, you've got Matthew Shepard and you've got things starting to shift around with Will and Grace. But I mean, like the consciousness back then, it just wasn't there. Uh, for the acceptance and tolerance of people who are different. And then, of course, God gives me a gay baby. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, in me that I had a gay baby. And I was able to, I mean, she was so pivotal to just my own adventure in acceptance and compassion for other people. And she was a little medium. She was always seeing spirits, always talking to ghosts. And she's become such a powerful, powerful person in her life. And they got married about five years ago. But I just wanted to touch upon how it is so important to be real with yourself because I, in my communication with folks all over the world, there are so many people who are afraid to just step into what they really want to do, whether that's a career choice or an education choice, whether it's a love choice or a sexual choice, uh, whether it's a religious choice or a spiritual choice. They're afraid because of the expectations of others. They're afraid because of dogmatic beliefs they've held inside of themselves. And it's really not until you do have that moment of bravery, like, I'm going to be me. I'm going to be authentically me. And I'm going to step in that fearlessly. And let's just see what happens, that everything can have the power to change. So I, I, I wanted to talk about a little bit more of that with you. And if you, how did you deal with, because I'm still dealing with my fundamentalism, like that still bubbles up. Like, how did you, Yeah. how did you walk away? Were you, weren't you afraid to walk away, like from the community and everything, the infrastructure? Yeah. 
Um, How did you get brave to do that? Uh, in the in the Mormon religion, you the big things that you do are you become baptized, which means you um, you know promise to live this way. Um, when you uh, do your endowment, which is making promises to God, and that happens when you're anywhere from 19 and older, um, you make all of these commitments to to God. And um, I really had to start looking at it as um, a contract because it is, right? God says, you do these things, I will reward you. This is what your payment will be. Okay. Um, well, I no longer wanted to be in that contract. <laughs> um, it no longer served me. It no longer suited me. And it took me a long time I to realize that it's okay to renegotiate the contract. It's okay to get out of the contract. Um, and on a side note, that's in our personal relationships too. Like when's the last time you renegotiated your contract, your marriage contract, you know, you've been married for 30 years, but you still, you're kind of still going on the ba basis of what you said I do to 30 years ago, but you've both changed. You've had kids, you, like everything changes. So there's, we all need to be constantly looking at the contracts we make with other people and knowing that we can renegotiate them. This served me when I was 20, but I'm 47 now. That's not going to, you know, it's not going to work. So I got to that point where I, I started doing little things like um, we created a, I created a coin that I had made out of clay and I had carved into it different things that had to do with my commitments to that God. And I gave the coin back. You know, the, the parable is that like he gave two servants a coin and one buried it and the other one multiplied it, right? So I kind of used that parable and thought, okay, I'm going to take this. I'm going to give back the coin that was given to me and we are going to end it. And um, it's so difficult, I think, because by the time we've gotten to that point, we're usually angry and bitter and mad and frustrated. And a lot of that comes from, you know, we've, we've been programmed or we've accepted this programming for so long that we've now been betrayed. And that's a very hard, hard feeling to go through. And we've been betrayed, not by the religion, but by ourselves. So we've been betrayed because I should have known better. That's what we tell ourselves all the time. I should have known better. When really it's like, you know what? That worked for a while. Now it doesn't. And now I can end it and I can move on. We're really, really hard on ourselves when it comes to, to, to this. And instead of just simply saying, you know what? That doesn't work anymore. I can move on from that. And then... The, the anger doesn't have to be there. I know leaving the Mormon church, there were, and there still is, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of men who are angry, who are traumatized uh, from being part of it, who are now, have now come out as gay or whatever. And they held so tightly to it. Um, and were so angry because they couldn't live their authentic self. Um, they didn't feel comfortable enough. They didn't feel confident enough. Confident enough. They didn't feel that they were able to. And um, that's tough. That's mm -hmm. tough. We need to give ourselves a little bit of a break when it comes to, to this stuff because you're not perfect. We're not meant to be perfect um, here. If we were, our bodies wouldn't age and we would just be we would all run around looking like Chris Hemsworth and, you know, whoever else like that. We would just, hey, we're all perfect. Here we go. Um, it just doesn't work that way. So I still, um, I still, in fact, I'm working, um, I'm working through uh, an initiation at the moment. I was going to ask you about this. I read about this on your yeah. Facebook. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I was, I'm working through that right now, which is um, basically taking steps and making commitments to the uh, old ways, the Northern traditions, pre-Christian Northern Europe um, that I'm working with. And um, so part of it is like really purification, but also looking at offerings and rites and things. But one of the things I didn't actually, I, I've been looking at this for a while and I didn't realize that this was so big, but I have Pollyanna syndrome. And I, you remember that movie, the Disney mm-hmm. movie Poly, Pollyanna, right? So I have that syndrome where no matter what, and it's to, it's to a detriment. I hope is absolutely necessary and appropriate, but when you do it, when I do it, I'll, this is me, when I do it as a natural, as an immediate response to anything negative, that doesn't help me live and sit with, not the negative, but the, the uncomfortable. It's like, oh, that'll be fine. You know, oh, you're okay. Or tell a joke and make everyone laugh when it, you know, like there are appropriate times for that, but it's to the, (laughs) I started getting so annoyed with myself yesterday. I'm like, (laughs) oh my God, I have Pollyanna syndrome. Like where, how did, how did I not like, and, and I really believed I was doing the best thing, you know? And I think that's where a lot of this happens is we, we, when we leave, we begin to see these patterns of behavior that really aren't aren't ours. They're they're patterns that we were taught how to do, and that are easy for us to keep repeating, and because they're easily reinforced by everyone around us. But being yourself and taking those risks and not and breaking away from those patterns, it takes a little bit. Like it, it takes some time to realize oh, okay, I'm being Pollyanna, I need to, one, why? Why am I doing it? What, what is it really, what am I keeping from myself? What am I hiding um, from? What do I not want to deal with? Um, and usually it's other people's trauma. I will be completely honest. When it, someone comes up to me in public and I feel Pollyanna kick in, I'm like, oh, it's because I don't want to deal with their trauma. And I don't want to deal, I don't, and, and I haven't figured out, I need to figure out how to appropriately boundary myself in those situations. Okay, so all of that that I just worked through is like, that's what's going to happen. Like, and it's going to be different for everybody. But a lot of times we, it's a, it's about boundaries. It's For us, it's about boundaries. Um, and I just heard something really brilliant the other day. It said, um, betrayal can often, no, boundaries can often feel like betrayal. And I was like, oh, yes, other people around me feel like they'll be trade when they can't get to me whenever they want after I put up a boundary, you know? Uh, and mm-hmm. so I'm constantly still trying to deconstruct that mindset um, that came from my Christian upbringing constantly. Like, I do believe in service, um, but I don't believe in service to the point of I now need um, opioids to help me get through the day so that I can make sure I'm serving everybody else. You know, I think there's a lot to be said. Uh, We have a big problem in Utah with um, prescription drugs and Hmm, it's not all about, oh yeah, pretty big. Yeah. Um, With um, like mood altering uh, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm opioids things like that so yeah we don't take enough time for ourselves and so getting caught up I still get caught up in being busy as well being busy idle hands are the devil's playground Mm -hmm. no not really Mm -hmm. it just Mm -hmm. means you're going to sit with yourself and like Mm -hmm. and sitting with yourself is harder than doing something wrong because then you have to sit with everything you've done wrong or everything that you feel like you've done wrong or all these things that come up that give us anxiety because we resist digging into them and and sometimes you don't have to dig into it sometimes you just have to love it you have to love that yes. decision you made yes. you have to love even the fact that it, it was 20 years ago and you just have to love it and 
and accept that that accept that that is you. I think that's the other part um, that I find fascinating about um, kind of what we do in working with other people is that, let me back that up. I find fascinating about myself is the things that we're capable of that we think are wrong or bad, or we've been told are wrong or bad. Um, the things that we're capable of and, and accepting that I'm capable of anything. And that is also part of our whole as a humanity, because if we can't look, we don't, we choose not to look at those things on a global aspect. Um, the things that happen in Yemen um, with starvation and little kids eating their fingers because they've now separated, they, the pain no longer is there, their hunger takes over. Like we don't look at those parts of humanity that we don't want to, that are that are hard to accept, that are that are dark, that are those darker parts of us. And yet, and that's very, uh, that's very um, exemplified within the fact that we don't want to look at those within ourselves either. So mm -hmm. coming, coming into those spaces to look at hunger, to look at greed, to look at um, sexuality, and to look at all of these things that are so human, but we reject and we reject looking at them and accepting that they are part of who we are when if we kind of just accepted them as that is part of our experience, I may never kill anybody. Am I capable? Yeah. Because if you get, if you come at my family, I will, I, mm -hmm. I will defend them, you know, but is that something I want to do? No, not, no. Um, but am I capable? Yeah. So I think it's a very fascinating kind of dive to go into those, those things that we ignore and like, and not even to, I don't even have to talk about them a lot. I just need to acknowledge that they're there. And then usually that opens up another door, right? That opens up another, oh, I feel that trauma in my knee now or my hip because I, you know, I'm having money issues, like stability issues come in your hips, right? Usually. So um, I absolutely believe that what, and what you said earlier, that our, our traumas, uh, for lack of a better term, um, come out as dis-ease in our body. So you are absolutely right. My knee, my hip, you know, my shoulder, <laughs> carrying too much of other people's stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's just something that let's look at that. I was taught that in my in my upbringing, in my religion, that we do that. Okay. Now again, okay, you have to start deconstructing that a little more. It's a constant thing, and, and uh, we just have to kind of give ourselves a, a break. Give yeah. yourself a break. It, it, you can't do it overnight, fun, and don't beat yourself up for doing, for, for repeating the pattern. Mm -hmm. The nice thing is you, you at least now know that there is a pattern and you can change it. Right. Wow. So many good things stated in that. Thank you so very much. Interesting yeah. about boundaries. Boundaries feel like betrayal. I think a lot of us are going to relate to that, putting up the boundaries and how you see all, everybody around you all of a sudden like, what's going on? But it's not betrayal. It's taking care of yourself. Um, in deference to time, because we've been on for a little while and, and I've been so, so happy to have you. I did want to ask a couple of questions. Um, yeah. If, you, if you'd be okay with that. And the first one is, sure. I wanted to talk about unverifiable personal gnosis. I mean, I have, I, yeah. I'm thinking about that. I love words, you know, I'm like, oh, that's an interesting term. Tell us about what that is. Yeah. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, this goes back to um, the concept that if we, even if we just take, let's just take the Northern traditions of pre-Christian Europe. Those were oral traditions. Those oral traditions, um, the lines were for the most part broken. We didn't get it written down. We don't know. So a lot of the things that we have are based upon archeological finds or cultural studies and the sagas, the eddas, the stories. And we, and we have to kind of translate those into what does that mean? So we we're missing pieces. Um, 
now. They didn't, back then, they didn't have a book that they went back and referenced either. Um, they would have these people in the community who were priests or shamans or whatever we want to call the term. Uh, they're, they're people that were their antenna to the gods, right? And um, those people would go speak to the gods or whoever on the other side and bring back information or interpret the signs around them in the world um, to then help guide the people. So now, if we bring that into modern times, we're very much a book-centered society. If it's not in the book, it's not true. And we've also turned it into, if it's not on the internet, it's not true. Right. Um, or if it is on the internet, it is true, right? That's, which we all know is not true. So where unverifiable personal gnosis comes in is that I've been working on my connection and my relationships with deities for a long time. I may have experienced my relationship with Odin and Odin in this aspect that is not written down in any sagas or eddas or stories or books anywhere. Now, I have this experience and I know for me that it's true because I've done the work. I've done the work to know when what it feels like in my body when something's true. I have this, I'm holding on to it. I will meet other people who have had the same experience. So when that happens, I have this experience that I can't verify in the books, but it's my personal own personal information. The nice thing is when you start to meet other people who then have these same experiences, you can then go, okay, it's, we now have uh, four or five, 10 people who have a relationship with Odin who experience this in the same way. So then we can then begin to, I don't wanna call it piecing it back together or even remembering, we're now building it again, building new. It's, it's modern, it's modern heathenry. It's modern, I don't wanna use that term, not heathenry. It's modern relationships with gods and deities that we now have to build because They've also been alive for 2000 years, just like humanity, and they don't have, they've grown as well. So mm -hmm. our relationships are going to be different, but U UPG really deals with the, the concepts that we experience as mediums or psychics or shamans in different cultures that are not able to be verified by other, by books. And then also now they can be verified by other people. So how are you cataloging and documenting these knowings? Is it just orally um, passed around or are you or writing a book? So, <laughs> um, a book? <laughs> oh my gosh, I've, listen, I've, because of how we work in our modern society, right? Like, oh, you have a book, you're going to be on my show. Um, it, it, writing a book gives you instant credibility mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Um, and so part of my journey was um, like, oh, I'm gonna, I need to write a book because of this, but I, I've tried and it will come when it comes. Right. Um, but I do have, um, one of the things that I really wanted to provide to people in talking to them about the runes and teaching about the runes was a, a workbook because there wasn't ever a workbook for me where it's like, okay, here's, you know, here's Feiyu, which is the rune of wealth. Uh, so here's kind of what we thought, but here, here's a pay, a blank page for you to write down your own personal information. And then here are some exercises following that, even meditations that you can do to help you align better or to connect with, to, to find that part of you that is that rune. Um, so for me, when I teach, I had created this workbook that's an ongoing process where people can yeah, they're blank pages. And when we talk about it, you can take notes, but then there's two other pages for you as you continue your journey, as you continue to experience them, you can continue writing your experiences in different things. Because if I do a reading for you and Feiyu and you know another rune come up, the combination of you and those two runes has a little bit different meaning than if it were the same for somebody else, because it's a different context, right? So we, it's about creating this library or this dictionary. And I, 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 so I have my own, 
Like I, I have that workbook for other people and I did it for myself so that I could, um, I continue to add things to it. So, oh, I experienced this this way. Um, and same with the gods. Um, mm -hmm. uh, more connected to the room book, but because they are connected to them. But um, yeah, I, I, I keep track of this, those things. And then I feel like, you know, as the, the further I get, the more people I meet, the more people I meet have the same experiences. So mm -hmm. it's been it's been really nice to be able to help share that with each other in terms of also building the confidence of people who are maybe newer mm -hmm. to, to exploring this stuff. So it's been it's so yeah, I, I try and keep track of it. I try. Wonderful. So final question, simply because we know you're psychic and connected and all that. Um, have yeah. you ever cast runes for us, our country, like the future and what, what's happening with us? It seems, you know, on the screen of our lives and the outpictured reality, like things are pretty crazy right now on the planet. And a lot of people are in a state of fear about what's coming down the pike. Um, have you looked into that at all? Do you have any observations or final thoughts about that? Yeah, um, that's, that's, that's a big question. I know. I'm sorry. It's kind of a loaded one. Um, no, <laughs> no, I, I like it though, because it, um, that's one of the questions that pulls me out of that. I need to pull my Pollyanna syndrome mm -hmm. out of right, get rid of right. it because, um, to truly, really look at what's going on is tough. So I will say the first thing I ever pulled, the first time I ever did that was when COVID started. And it was like, um, you know, you, you've got like millions and millions of people that need to die before COVID's over, you know, like it was, it was a really interesting, like large number. Um, this is what you, you feel, discovered when you cast the runes. Was that okay? This, this, that came through a psychic impression. Okay. Um, when I asked like, how long is COVID going to last? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a time frame; It was a number of people dying time, which was interesting to me. Um, so I really feel, I feel like when I'm looking at how things are, you know, just let's, let's just say our country at the moment, um, we can't even look, we can't even look at something objectively to figure out what the problem is. Um, we have no idea how to do that um and that's going to be one of the things that makes it very difficult for us to move forward um if we don't know what the problem is we can't fix it and there's there's um there's a lot of there's a term have you ever um seen the book uh the artist's way oh yes Julia so Cameron, I believe, right? mm -hmm. yep I believe um, in there that talks about like, there's a, a one sort of person that's called a crazy maker. I believe that's where it comes from. Um, and this person, when everything is peaceful, they come and like swirl up these, these whirlwinds to make things not peaceful. Um, I think we don't know how to live in peace. I think that our biggest, our biggest challenge in, uh, is going to be um, figuring out uh, how to live in peace. Um, oh. I actually think there was uh, like a study done by somebody who uh, every so often, every so many years after war, um, when peace is no longer valued, then right. we, we tend to fall into this chaotic thing again. And it's, it's a pattern that we fall into. Um, but but looking deeper into, into that, just on um do we ever come into a space of peace i mean do you see that we get there lord jesus please <laughs> right so um uh, i i i wish that um would happen and i would also say that um you know in all of the in all of the world religion there's a beginning and an end, and then a re-beginning, like another beginning. So 
I I think that the the key is to find the peace in the moment that you're in, um, and to try and find people around you who will allow the same and who will do the same. Um, because our interaction with the planet, our interaction with nature, I only want to say the planet, our interaction with nature is one of superiority. And that's going to be one of our big downfalls. We, we, we see ourselves as the top of the food chain. No, we're not. COVID showed us that, um, I think. Um, although, depending on who, where you think it came from, um, you know, most of us, if, if, if something happened catastrophically and we couldn't go to the grocery store anymore, what would, you know, none of us, I mean, very few of us know how to grow a garden. Very few of us have chickens, very, you know, very few of us could sustain, like, where are you going to get your water? So one, one thing, one natural disaster that shuts all of that down and nature, nature shows you really quickly, the planet will show us really quickly who's back on top. So I think one of our biggest, one of our biggest things is that we, um, our hubris mm. and our, we, we're also very separated from the, the cycle, the cycles that are the patterns of, of how this world actually functions, um, the nature of it. We try and control and we try and, and organize the chaos because we see it as chaos, but really nature is nature. It's not chaotic, it has its own order. We just don't understand it. We, we refuse to understand. I don't even know if I answered your question. I No, I, 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 I think you did. I think you did. Um, I hold out hope that there's enough of us that are connecting heart to heart and in our consciousness and in our vision, like of a better world, of a more humane society, of a more tolerant and equal and compassionate people, of being good to the planet and um, the oceans and the animals and the trees. Like I believe there's enough of us that if we point our consciousness in the direction of that, we can shift it and change. I just, I do think we're there though. It's like a crossroads. It's, we gotta do oh, it yeah. now. We gotta come together now. And we have to yeah. be very intentional about this so that we can truly shift it. But I know that it's possible. I know that we can do it. I just want people to wake up because I think so many of us, it's so tribal out there. It's so group oriented and again, labels. And I'm in this group, you're in that group, me, you. Yeah everybody's an other and we don't see that we are all connected and we're all the same neville goddard said yeah. everything is just you pushed out so if you don't like what you're seeing and the guys you know standing across the aisle from you that's just an invitation to look into yourself and see what you're helping yeah. to create on the planet we just need more yeah. people to kind of become conscious to that i do think there's hope oh yeah and i'll continue to pray how about that <laughs> yeah and i think i think the one thing i would love to see um Two in a, in a, in a taking that a step further, I would love to see um, us mobilize. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that, and and not mobilize in terms of like <laughs> an assault on a city. It, but it's like mobilized in really like where I live, we don't have recycling because it costs too much. Like we don't have, you know, like there are definitely things that you know what it's time to get off the. It's time to quit being the Monday morning armchair quarterback <laughs> and get up and actually do the things that we're talking about. And um, I think that's probably where the one thing I feel like is lacking in maybe modern new age societies, uh, cultures, is that we always think about it being outside of us and like where we want to ascend. And, and that's all done through this quiet meditation, but there are acts of rebellion <laughs> As recycle uh you know buy local like all of these things that will really help us and really do continue to connect us to the people around us you know if you buy from the farmer down the street or the, who lives out in the country that connects you to him even deeper um and i think uh you know uh, taking it even to the next step is um really mobilizing those things and really and, you know, we can't be perfect at it. I can't be perfect at recycling because I, I don't have the option, but I can do my dangest and mm -hmm. I can make, I, I can make the best decision in the moment that I can make. And, um, 
all those things are, are things that we can apply to any relationship we have with ourselves, with the planet, with other people, with the animals. And so I, 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 I agree with you completely that we're at a crossroads and that there needs to be a call to action. So whether that's out of your mouth or my mouth or both of them and everybody else who's, mm -hmm. you know, on this, then I think that's, that's where we're at. We need to do it for sure. I 100% agree. I think there's so many people just hunkered down because there's so many crazy things going on, but we do need to step out. Yeah. We need to put our money where our mouth is. And we also need to be yeah. so much, so intentional. Well, so sure. one last thing before we leave, um, I know that you do readings and I know that you work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not sure if you work with people in groups, but how would somebody reach out to you and connect with you and be become a client if they wanted to do so? Sure. Thank you for asking. Um, the easiest way is to go to my website, which is uh, runewalker.com, R-U-N-E-W-A-L-K-E-R.com. And um, there's a contact page there where you can fill out your name and email. And if you have a, a comment or a question, that's the, probably the, the best point of contact. I do have Instagram and Facebook, but like the website is, is probably the, the easiest to, uh, to get to. So thank you. Fantastic. And I will include the links to all of that in the description of this podcast or video wherever you're listening or watching this. Yeah. Ken, this has been such a, I mean, I had so many more questions for you. I'm sorry. I was, again, I was fascinated um, by you and I just connected with you and I was actually reading your Facebook and you were talking about the individual rooms and runes and it looked like you were coming up with different interpretations. I was just geeking out and just reading through all of that. You are just a really thank beautiful you. person. And I thank you so much for sharing yourself, your story and your path with my listeners. Um, and I wish you nothing but good things and blessings and that your initiation is exactly what it ought to be in divine order. Thank you. You're thank you. Welcome. I appreciate that. And thank you so much for reaching out to, to talk to me and, and allow me to allow me the space to talk about my path and the runes. And um, I've been um, fascinated listening to, to your podcast. So um, awesome. And I um, it's Neville, right? Like I'm totally into I'm I'm yeah. I'm I'm going to dig deeper into that because there are some things that really resonated with me. So I yeah, appreciate that you're level. sharing your path and your message. Thank you so much. Well, you have a beautiful rest of your day. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you.